Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is a review for Class of 1984, which was a film that was done in 1982. Well, at least it was released in 1982. It feels kind of weird to say that because it's like 84, 82. Now, it's not totally uncommon for films to do that where they're projecting forward. Now, people can guess as to why this was just two years later. Maybe they were kind of theorizing in the film of if we don't get a handle on the youth of today, this is where we're going in just two short years. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, there will be spoilers in this like most of my videos because this is an older film. I uh, also want to say it's available currently on the Shutter streaming service. So if you have interest in watching it, which I would recommend it for at least one viewing, go stop this video, go watch it, then come back and we can talk about all the spoilers because that's what I will be doing. Now, let me give you some information on this. The director of this particular one was a man by the name of Mark Lester, and he did films such as Firestarter and Commando. Those would be the most well-known of what he did. So he not only directed this film, but he was involved in writing the screenplay. Now, it wasn't just him on the screenplay, because the story idea and more screenplay work came from a one Tom Holland. Now, people would know Tom Holland from things such as Fright Night, which is one of my favorites of his films, Child's Play, which also is quite good, and one that people don't talk about enough, in my opinion, um, Thinner, which I think is a really good horror film. Uh, it's actually been a while since I've watched it, but um, I remember really, really liking it, and I think it's about due for a revisit. So I'm a fan of Tom Holland. I think he's done some really great stuff. I mean, just just citing Fright Night in Child's Play is kind of enough. And that's the first Child's Play, just so people know. Uh, this has a really young Michael J. Fox in the film, which is really weird to see. And this was pre-Family Ties. So much like a lot of, you know, horror films, you have some big names. Well, not with a lot of horror films. But within the horror genre, it is a place where there have been plenty of people who become kind of big names or really big names who they get their start in the horror genre because it's an easy way to get in. And here we go with Michael J. Fox is yet another one. But it's really weird to see him so young because he's so young in this. Uh, the other big name in this is, is a one Roddy McDowell who then was in Fright Night as well. Great, great role in Fright Night. I think he did a really good job in this film as well for what he was given. Uh, he... Obviously, he worked with Tom Holland again, so I don't know if he was really introduced to him with the film because I don't like I know that Tom Holland was involved in the story of it and writing, helping with writing the screenplay, but I don't know if he was like on set or anything or actually met Roddy McDowell. But he, I'm sure he at least saw his chops in the film, so he would be like, Oh, he'd be great for Fright Night. So the theme song for this film is done by Alice Cooper, and listening to it in the beginning, so they play it in the beginning and they play it in the end. Listening to it in the beginning, I was just like, oh, this is kind of like a fun 80s rock song, and it's Alice Cooper, so cool. Well, then they played it again at the end, and I was actually listening to the lyrics, and I was like, you know what? If you listen to the lyrics of this theme song, it gives you kind of the underlying themes of the actual film itself, which is kind of talking about, you know, where is the youth of today going if you don't do something now, like this is the future, that type of thing, which is part of why I was saying, like, maybe they did it just uh, released the film in 82, but we're calling it Class of 1984 because they were saying, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time. We need to get a handle on the youth of today. Otherwise, in just a short two years, we could be in, you know, post-apocalyptic realm, at least when it comes to high schools. And that's kind of what they set up in this film is it's like this post-apocalyptic. Now, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with the information on this and then before I get into the like the real uh, nitty gritty of what happened in the film, I want to say something else about theme um, or actually genre. So the film was banned actually in a bunch of countries because of its lewd nature. It's, it's another one of those kind of head scratchers because like I get it. Maybe it's because of the rape scene because there's a rape scene in this and I'll talk about it later, but it was... I don't think the film needed it. It seemed kind of like too much in a way, but I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Uh, it had two science fiction based sequels, which when I read that, I was like, hmm, what, <laughs> what type of uh, path did they take for these science fiction sequels? So I kind of am interested to see it, but it had two sequels. One was called Class of 1999, and that one was released in 1990. And then the other one was called Class of 1992, or 1999-2, The Substitute, and that was released in 1994. So 
So let me say real quick, some people who have seen this, I mean, if you've seen this, I, I guarantee, well, I can't guarantee, but most likely a lot of people have watched this film and have had the thought early on in the film like I did, which is, is this actually a horror film? So I don't think it's a straight horror film, but I think it's one of those films that falls into the realm of horror adjacent. There are horror aspects to it, and there's some horrific stuff in it, but it's not a straight horror film. Um, so for me, like the horror stuff in it, obviously there's death and there's um, malice with the kids, and they're out of control. So it kind of plays a little bit like a invasion film, like a kind of like a siege film a little bit or you know alone in your house and here comes the intruder because there is an actual scene with that in it but even without that one scene it kind of feels like the school is being invaded and intruded upon with a bad element of who these you know gang member kids are so I think it kind of works in that sense it's it, it kind of hits that bit of a subgenre of horror film like the invasion film or the intruder film I think would be a better way of putting it uh, you certainly get the idea that there's no control over the students, especially when Roddy McDowell's character, Corrigan, is immediately saying to Norris, you got to look the other way. Because he was saying, hey, I just saw that kid, you know, pass another kid a straight razor and then go through the metal detector. And he's just like, hey, man. And that's how the administration, other than Norris, reacts throughout the entire film. It's just like, what are you going to do? Like, we're, we're, we don't have enough... Uh, enough gall to stand up to these horrible kids because we know that if you do that you're going to get something terrible coming back your way and you obviously see that later on in the film with Norris uh but but then you also see later in the film by not dealing with it and having so many things done to you Corrigan loses it like totally loses it and then he ends up getting killed because I mean he basically kills himself because he just goes over the edge which those are some good scenes I'll talk about that a little bit more but uh, the setup of a crimi criminal empire kind of ups the stakes for the teacher's protagonist, being Norris in this. Um, they establish very, very early on in the film, like, there is a criminal empire at play here. The drugs, the prostitution, just the overall uh, fear that's being uh, dispersed amongst all the students because of this gang that Stegman and his goons are running. And uh, the for that reason, when they introduce the awesome piano skills of Stegman it's very surprising because you're just like oh I thought this guy was just like this low life piece of crap but look he's got this amazing skill so it kind of makes me wonder like what is it supposed to be that the the only problem that Stegman has with Norris at least in the beginning is that he won't let him be the pianist for the orchestra like is that it because that's kind of how it played off to me and unless I miss something because, um, you know, sometimes I'm kind of looking down at my phone and, like, you know, doing notes, so I have a tendency to miss, like, something if it's really quick, but it seemed to me like Stegman being like, look, let me be the pianist for the orchestra, and Norris being like, no, not until you grow up, basically stop um, wrecking the school and wrecking everyone's chance of, like, getting a legitimate education because you're ha leaving everyone in fear, uh, then maybe we can talk. So it makes you also wonder then what would have happened had Norris kind of approached it from a different standpoint. And and instead of being punitive and saying, hey, you're you're a terrible person, you can't do, you know, you can't use your p piano skills, being like, okay, you know, I recognize that you have a lot of behavioral issues, to put it lightly, but I'm going to give you a shot and maybe through cultivating something more wholesome, we can change you. We can we can get you to a better place and teach you that there there is a spot for you in the school that doesn't have to do with, you know, causing fear and violence and distributing drugs and stuff like that. Like you you can be productive and, and we'll help cultivate this. So if he had taken that standpoint, um, it may have come out differently. And that's one of the things you definitely think of towards the end is if he had just said yes to him being the pianist for the orchestra. How would things have gone? I mean, granted, we probably wouldn't have had much of a movie, but, you know, story-wise. Uh, the first death comes later than expected. Uh, I feel like a lot of the story just keeps going, 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 and, and that's why you start thinking, like, is this actually a horror film? Like, when are we going to get to that element? But you do get the first 
death and it is kind of the strong drugs kill type moment that you know the the 80s had a lot of the whole dare to keep kids off drugs or was that more the 90s i feel like it's 80s and into the 90s the dare program trying to keep kids off of drugs but um i might be wrong i think it may be more 90s but anyway the, there's there's always been this this push of like drugs kill keep kids off of drugs especially when they're in high school and the first death is you know the kid because he's so high on these drugs climbs to the top of the flagpole falls off dies so that's like a very strong statement of kids don't do drugs because they'll kill you I mean, can't get much stronger than that. So I like how the principal thinks the kid's behavior is kind of like a whatever thing. But then as soon as Norris uh, is is uh, implicated as hitting Stegman, even though we actually didn't and there was no evidence of that, he's immediately like, oh my God, you can't do this. You're so guilty. You know, it's this, it's it's the, the extreme of what it normally would be where, you know, the principal would come from it at an, in a neutral way and kind of say, okay, well, let's look at the evidence, what's actually going on, ideally. But in this one, he's just immediately like, I don't really care what the kids do because we can't really control them. I care what you did, and I, and I don't even need to have evidence to say that you did something wrong. And it just seems a little over the top with the writing. It's a little too much. I mean, they could have given that idea without making it as strong as it was, so I think that's a little bit of an issue with the writing. So, you know, uh, there's a pretty good scene when Corrigan loses it. And actually, it's more than one scene. It's a few scenes. One where he has the gun when he's trying to teach class and he's trying to get answers out of people, insinuating that it'll shoot them if they don't participate in class and be better students. Uh, and then the ultimate where he ends up killing himself, where he starts trying to run people down with his car, uh, <laughs> the gang members, that is. And that that scene in particular, one, it was it was well done, but it also made me think, Man, some of the things that stuntmen do, I mean, I know it's safer now, but it's never like 100% safe. And back then it was even less safe. And like a stunt like the the person who was a stuntman for Stegman's character, like being on on the front of the hood of the car while it's like jerking around and driving and trying to like wreck, pretty dangerous. And that's just what it made me think of. I'm like, that's intense, man. Stunt people, I'll tell you. Uh, I like how Norris's wife says she needs to leave until she has the baby. As if, like, as soon as she has the baby, it's okay to bring that newborn baby back to that environment. Like, it's literally said the way where she's just like, I'm going to have to leave until I have the baby. Insinuating that she'll come back as soon as she's had the baby. That, like, she feels like she's in danger just because she's pregnant. And then if she's not pregnant, like, everything will be fine. That's a dialogue issue with the writing where it's just like, that's that doesn't make any sense. This is ridiculous. It's just something that kind of stood out to me. So, talking about the rape scene now, it was a bit much. Now, not only was it a bit much in the sense of you didn't need it because you didn't need it, they could have just broken into the house and, you know, stole things or vandalized the house or, you know, like hit her or something or just kidnapped her because they end up kidnapping her anyway. So, honestly, they should have just abducted her and that's it. The, the whole rape scene, totally unnecessary. I'm fine with having rape scenes in, in horror movies like this if it actually adds to the story, if it's important to the story. Like, you know, rape revenge films. You know, it makes sense because it's, it adds to the story. This, it doesn't. It doesn't really add to the story, so you didn't even need it. So I'd rather them just not even go there. It just comes off then as being just really distasteful for no reason and too much. It's too much in my opinion, but that's just me. Um, the other thing is the rape scene was shot horribly. Like it looked terrible, not in the sense of like, it looked like a brutal rape, but in the sense that like the actual directing and filmmaking of it looked terrible. And I, it, it had like some blinking shots that changed and it just, just, they should have nixed it. They just should have nixed it because it wasn't even shot. Well, it wasn't even done. Well, it was crap like probably one of the worst parts of the movie to be honest directing wise and the cinematography wise to be honest but i mean overall like cinematography directing was good the acting was was better than i expected going into the film so i was pretty happy with that there's a good point that's made uh that the bad kids get so much of the attention within the school and then all the good kids basically end up getting forgotten and i feel like this actually happens with schools where 
you have to take so much time in, with disciplining the terrible kids or just worrying about what they're going to do next and reacting to it or being proactive about trying to make sure that there isn't a problem that, you know, the good kids become forgotten. And you really see that in the moment where, you know, they're going to have that um, concert and the, you know, the principal literally is talking about, you know, the bad kids get so much attention because Norris have kind of pointed out, we have a lot of really good students here. And it does seem kind of like um, the principal really wasn't thinking about that. And it's at that moment where that that idea dawns on dawns on him. And he's just like, oh, yeah, well, I guess, you know, we just spend so much time thinking about these bad kids. And I feel like that's a real life thing. And, and for that reason, the good students a lot of times at some of these schools won't get everything they need because it's the bad students that get all the attention. And not just from the administration there, but also from people from the outside looking in at, at what like the school's reputation is. So, uh, portions in the school after dark are my favorite. That kind of like a chase scene where Norris is trying to find his wife wherever she is, like the the school's all dark and she and he's following like the one woman and she's going like in and out of the doors and he can't find her and then they end up getting into fights and he kills the one um it it oh plus during that like when they end up actually catching him and they and they beat uh Norris the they had some like extreme close-ups on the faces of the gang members and i felt like that was a, a shot that made it made it seem very disturbing, like getting that close up on their faces when, when they were looking the way they were, like they were kind of deranged, but also really enjoying inflicting pain on Norris. I felt like it, it created this disturbing image that worked really well. So um, the arm sawing moment is pivotal in this film. So not only is it probably the best death in the film, I mean, some people might argue Stegman's at the end is the best one. It is. It was a good one. But I think the band saw where he saws his arm off and then he throws him on the saw. I think that's the best death scene in the film. And it's pivotal. It's totally pivotal because that's the moment that Norris decides I can't, I can no longer not fight back because he had been kind of trying to get the police involved and the, the administration and everything. But that's the moment where he decides I have to physically defend myself. And that involves now me going on the physical offensive. And so he kills this guy. So that's why it's a pivotal moment because that's where Norris realizes that he has no recourse other than to physically fight. Um, good moment. So that's all I have to say about the actual like, film film i like the ending of it i think that the the stegman death at the end was impactful enough uh and then like i said it kind of makes you wonder at the end like did he you know if he had been able to be the pianist you know how would that have been and it's interesting to think this you know if he had been the pianist his whole goal then was to get to that concert well in the end of the film he makes it to the concert but not in the way that he wanted to you know he's physically at the concert because he's hanging through the roof so he got he got there he was going to get there one of two ways and he got there the worst way possible so um so talk about the themes a little bit so it's an old fear of youth out of control and beyond redemption which seems to be echoed with every passing generation this is that that age-old theme of older generations looking at the younger generations and saying oh they're so lost they're so wayward they care about nothing it's all about chaos and destruction and drugs and giving into their pleasures and doing whatever they want and their generation's going to ruin everything. And we're headed for an apocalypse because their generation's just going to destroy it all. And you see that strongly in this film. I mean, just look at the way the school looks. There's graffiti everywhere. Everything looks just totally broken down and scuzzy. Everyone's afraid of this gang. They run everything. They're allowed to do whatever they want. It's just this image of, like, apocalypse. And this idea that the film throws at you that... If these, if this gang of kids are just, if they go unchecked, we're headed to like societal apocalypse, basically. Uh, the idea of the youth looking so useless and wayward signals an apocalyptic societal future. I guess I, I just already said that. Punk culture was used because it symbolized total, total chaos in film at one point. Uh, the punk culture, yes, for a while was heavily mined um, in horror films and other films. 
as kind of being synonymous with chaotic youth. So that's why you kind of have it here being like, oh, these kids are punks. But there's also an extra element of Nazism, which it isn't played up a lot, but it's it's there. Like they give the salute at one point, the like the Sikh Heil, and it's like disturbing, <laughs> honestly, because it's because it's this meshing then of like punks and Nazis. And obviously Nazis are the most disgusting scum in the world, always will be. Um and then you end up seeing like swastikas. It's not a strongly focused on thing, but every here and there, like if you look in the background, like graffiti, you'll see a swastika. There's one point when one of the gang members is wearing a shirt that has a swastika on it. It is kind of obscured a little bit, but if you look, you can tell. So there's this kind of um, hint that they're also into Nazism. There's not much past just seeing the symbols there and their Sikh Heil moment, but yeah. It's kind of that that extra to say evil, <laughs> like like a lot of the times it, it is that Nazism is invoked in film to like kind of be like this is unequivocable evil. Like is it as if the actions didn't speak loud enough? We will give you the symbol of Nazism to let you know beyond evil. So it's a little heavy handed for that reason. They could have just kept with the punk style, or they didn't even need to use the punk style. The kids could have just been. You know, terrible kids, like whatever. But, you know, those were the images that were kind of used back then. Um, and yeah, and then the last thing I just had written down was just, you know, it makes you wonder what would have happened if Norris had given in the Stegman and just been like, look, let's go with your piano skills. Let me help cultivate that and let's get you in the orchestra. Because it would have taken him out of that criminal element, potentially. Not definitely, but potentially. But, you know, it's a story. And like I said, we wouldn't have a film and we wouldn't have the film that we do without that. So... Uh, overall, I enjoyed watching the film. I'm not sure if it's one that I feel I need to watch again, but it was a good watch the first time. Uh, it takes a while to get going, so it feels like maybe it's a little longer than it should be. I think they kind of needed to get to the meat of the story a little bit faster. Uh, but once it gets going towards like the middle, it's it kind of really picks up, and it's way more interesting, and I enjoyed it. So i uh, going to give it a rating out of five stars with half stars in play gonna put this one at a three i feel like a three is appropriate for it i do recommend it go check it out like i said it's on shutter at the moment so let me know put some comments down there have you seen it already what are your thoughts do you like it do you hate it in between whatever and then hit that subscribe for me if you could that's a big favor you could do for me because i don't make money doing any of this i just use my free time what little bit i have because i'm pretty busy uh but this makes me feel good putting these creative things out there and i love doing film analysis so it's a lot of fun so anyway please hit that subscribe for me you can do the likes but the subscribe subscribe means means more to me but regardless thank you for checking out this video and until next time keep it brutal